It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. <laughs> My timing not so good today. And today we're going to do the technical aspects of delivering your music to a music library with special guest star, Mr. Craig Pilo. <laughs> Craig is our head screener at Taxi. He's also a highly accomplished musician, a world-class drummer, um, was one of the all-time great screeners, and then uh, we made him head screener. How long has it been? Like nine months ago or something? Over a year. It's been over a year? Yeah, it would have wow. been de December was the year, Mark. Wow. Yeah. Well, happy anniversary, and then man. And then what, <laughs> four, four, three or four years before that screening? So this is my... I started in October of 2018 with you guys. Wow. So, yeah. So, yeah. Here Over four here. years, right? Yeah, four yeah. and a half years. Wow. Um, and he's just been great. We, we love having him on the staff, and he's had a bunch of stuff go into libraries himself, a bunch of placements. He, uh, before he started working here, he had his own little library, a boutique library, as they say. Um, so he really knows this stuff from all angles, but really what he knows best is you guys because he's listened to thousands upon thousands and thousands of submissions. So like I said, we're going to talk about the technical aspects of delivering uh, your music to a library. Maybe not the sexiest topic, but really super important. We had another problem again. Uh, a library owner called us uh, yesterday. No, that would have been Sunday. Anyway, Tom came in this morning when I first walked in the door and he said, uh, we have a company trying to reach out to two members and they're ghosting the library owner. So all my life, I want to get my music out there. I want to get a TV placement. I want to get a film placement. I want people to hear and enjoy and appreciate my music. And then they get somebody from the industry calling them and they ghost them. In the case of one person, it's because she mistyped her email address when she signed up for her taxi account. So you know what they say, garbage in, garbage out. We had a bad email address. That's the one we forwarded to the person in the industry. Um, and the other one, I don't know what the deal is. But anyway, so we're trying really hard to give you guys ammunition so that you don't blow relationships. And one of the ways that people blow relationships is by not submitting things the way the company asked them to submit it. And uh, we are going to play a video in a minute where Craig actually took the time to go home, make this cute little, cute little video. Oh, it's yeah, a cute, little, a cute video. little video, yeah. <laughs> but it's a really good video that explains, you know, uh, how to export your mixes, how to export your stems and everything. And then after that, it's about 17 minutes long. We're going to do the whole rest of the show Q&A with you guys, but specifically on the topic of the technical aspects of delivering your music. Um, so before that, I want to say, if you haven't already given us a thumbs up, please do. Um, subscribe by hitting that red button. And even better yet, hit the alert button um, so that you get alerts when we go live. I uh, want to mention that next week we're going to have Robin Frederick on the show. She's always a popular guest. She used to be our head screener about five years ago, six years ago, something like that. Um, and I want to mention that today we're sitting in the control room of Criteria Studio A. Uh, there we are. Um, and, uh, oh, I've got a weird little light thing going on there. That's odd. Anyway, I'll fix it. There that. we go. Fix <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, Criteria Studio A uh, in Miami, Florida. That was the first room I ever worked in. I love that place. Still very close with all the people there. Um, I want to thank my buddy Trevor Fletcher for sending me these new backgrounds and I want to mention that just some, this is literally a smattering of the hundreds of acts that have worked there. People like David Bowie, Eric Clapton, um, you certainly know I Shot the Sheriff, that was done, uh, Criteria, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Crosby, Stills & Nash, Stills & Young, all different combinations and permutations of those guys. Uh, if I didn't say it already, ACDC, Two Live Crew, Bee Gees, Aretha Franklin, James Brown. I feel... Oop, I, I don't want to get a copyright thing. Uh, anyway, James Brown actually recorded that song uh, there. Uh, Layla, 
Derek and the Dominoes, Eat a Peach, Almond Brothers, Aerosmith, Hotel California, um, Billy Joel, just on and on. Fleetwood Mac, it, it's an all-star place. Man, that lights drive me crazy. But you know we'll what? We'll fix it on the... Yeah, I'll fix it while we're watching the video. Okay, so here we go. This is Craig's video uh, all about the technical aspects of delivering your music to a music library. We'll be back with you live in 16 minutes and 49 seconds. Hi everybody, this is Craig, your head screener, and uh, today we're going to talk about preparing the proper deliverables. So uh, you guys have been churning out a lot of great music lately. You made it past our evil screeners. You finally get your music forwarded to a music library, and bang, you get a phone call or an email saying, Craig, I want to sign your greatest hit. I just think what you did is awesome, and we'd love to have you on our library. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, the immediate reaction, especially for those of you that haven't got a lot of forwards or don't have a lot of placements in a library or on TV, is to go home or drop what you're doing, rush to your DAW, rush to your engineer, get this stuff done as quick as possible. The contract, just don't even read it. Michael vetted it, so we're all going to be millionaires. Um, that's not really the best way to go about this. While it is true and it is imperative that time is of the essence, don't waste time, uh, it's also important not to rush through the process. Make sure you fully read and understand the contract. We've beat that to death and we probably will beat it some more, uh, but that's not what today's video is about. Again, with the contract, if there's anything you don't understand, exclusive versus non-exclusive, um, how long it's the, the duration of it, that kind of thing, uh, be sure you understand everything in that contract before you sign it. That's number one. But probably get that taken care of first. Make sure you sign it, scan it, have it ready to go as a PDF. Um, the audio portion and the, the, the deliverables are kind of what I want to talk about today. Um, like I said, you want to make sure you give the client exactly what they ask you for. Um, that goes for how to label the file, uh, alternate mixes, stems if needed, as well as the individual um, specifications of what kind of file they want. 24-bit, 48K is pretty standard, but some libraries want a WAV file, some want an AIFF. I personally prefer the AIFF files because the metadata travels with the file. Uh, WAV files are great too, but then very often you will have to fill out a separate spreadsheet with the metadata, your IP number, um, how the music makes you feel, what, whether it's fast, slow, a ballad, that kind of thing. So um, I promised Michael I wasn't going to talk a lot today, but I will say this. I know a lot of you do your own engineering. Some of you have engineers that do your music for you, which is great. They, they're both great. Um, regardless of whether you do your own engineering or not, you are responsible for the final delivery. Just much like doing your taxes. Um, I don't do my own taxes, but I sign something saying that I am responsible for the contents of my return. This is very much the same way. Whether or not you prepare these audio files or you have an engineer or a brother, sister, employee, whatever, you are responsible for giving this client what they want. So it is up to you to understand what's going on and make sure it's done properly. So if they ask for WAV files 2444, uh, 2448, that's what you need to make sure that you're delivering the files at especially if they ask for something and you give them something else. It's not like, oh, you're never going to work in this town again, but you're going to test their patience, and when they get a request the next time, maybe they will call you, maybe they won't. Um, the people that get called back again and again as repeat clients um, are the people that give them exactly what they want, how they want it, when they want it. Paying attention to detail here is paramount. I'm going to jump right in the DAW and show you exactly how I do things in Cubase. Now, a lot of people use Pro Tools, a lot of people use uh, Logic, Studio One. All the DAWs have a very similar process for exporting files. If you are not familiar with that process, I'm going to demonstrate it to you in Cubase, but if you are not familiar with that process, please go on YouTube and figure out how to manipulate the files in your respective DAW. For example, if you use Logic, if this video makes no sense to you, uh, Craig, I can't use Cubase, what you're doing, the process, so go to YouTube and click Export Files in Logic or Exporting Files in Pro Tools. 
educate yourself with the necessary information to give these clients what they want, even if you're not doing it yourself. Okay. All right. Again, I promised Michael I wouldn't talk a lot, so let's dive right into the DAW and get you guys started. Okay, so here we are inside Cubase. As you can see, I have mine laid out with my MIDI instrument tracks up at the top. And before I export everything, I convert everything to an audio file, which is down here at the bottom. Uh, I chose this session because there's not a lot of tracks and it appears to be pretty short as well. Eyeballing it, it appears to be about a minute and 40 seconds. Um, the reason I want to keep an eye on the duration is because when I export it, I want to make sure that it's approximately right. Again, to make sure we don't have excessive space at the beginning of the track or the end of the track. So this is about a minute and 40 seconds. I want to make sure that that's what I end up with. This was obviously a project that required 90 seconds to two minutes, so I came in at 140. Looking at my MIDI here, I normally close that out uh, because I don't want to get confused or anything like that. Uh, I was checking at my strings right here, which come in halfway through. This is not a very string heavy project. Uh, I just kind of added those about halfway through. Uh, to give it some developmental arc, a sense of build. Um, normally, if I was doing a bigger string session, um, I would separate out the violins, the violas, the cello, the bass, pan it accordingly, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this isn't really a session about creating production music. This is more about exporting. So I'm going to close out the MIDI right now. In some cases, I will go into the console and turn the volume down of my MIDI tracks just in case they become unmuted, uh, it would mess with my overall output volume level. Again, with these turned all the way down, in the unlikely event that it becomes unmuted, it won't affect my overall mix. And again, my final mix is exactly the way I intended it. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the export setting. I'm going to adjust the file name. I'm going to insert my prefix to whatever library or client I am exporting to. In this case, I'll just put taxi as the prefix. And previously, obviously, I was dealing with the MP3 because that's what was approved, but I am gonna get in there and change it to wave 24-bit uh, 48K. And again, there are some different formats in here, but I'm gonna stick with 2448 wave because that's what this library wants. So I'm going to go ahead and hit export and my full mix is on its way to my final folder. You can see it doesn't take that long with Cubase. It takes a little less than a minute to create it, but we're not going to sit here and wait. I'll cut ahead. Okay, now that's done. So I'm going to go ahead and create my first alternate mix. Um... A lot of times they want three or four, four or five, five or six alternate mixes, depending on the size of your project. Um, on this one, I'm going to do an alternate mix without the lead. I don't really have a lead on this file. This was a, or in this session, this was a background track. So I'm just going to go ahead and rename this one lead for demonstration purposes. And I'm going to export it again. And I'm going to say um, Craig's greatest hit underscore no lead. Um, again, it just gives the editors another less busy option. And I just renamed, uh, one of the tracks, the lead that was actually, um, a vocal reverse polarity synth track. Um, not really busy enough to be considered a lead track, but let's just go ahead and mute it and pretend that it was some sort of lead line theme or melody. And, um, we'll export that. All right, I also put all my drums and my impact hits and swells and stuff in one folder for just this reason uh, to create my no drums mix. So I'm going to go ahead and mute that and I'm just going to export that. That'll be my no drums mix. So when I'm done with that, I'm going to go ahead and create my bass and drums mix. Um, again, there's a bunch of ways to do this. Um, you can either 
mute everything and then unmute the bass and the drums or just solo the bass and the drums. Uh, you know, everybody's got their own way of manipulating their DAW. Again, I won't make you wait. Okay, so now I have a handful of alternate mixes. I'm going to go in here now, um, take inventory, see where I'm at, and I'm going to create a folder that says Craig's Greatest Hit Stems. All right, and this is where the individual instrument tracks are going to go. Then I'm going to go back and export everything one instrument at a time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put my uh, impact hits and percussion in the same track as the drums because there's not a lot. Um, if it's a busy session and there's a lot of impact hits every eight bars or something, you might want to put that on a separate track. Um, also, when I export this stuff, I make sure that I start my bar... Uh, my selection bar at the top at the beginning of the session, or at least give it a one bar count off before anything starts. That lets editors line everything up a little more accurately. Um, I go ahead and shut the mastering plug in off as well. I don't do a whole lot of fancy mastering. I have the Ozone 9 mastering suite. I don't have a big um, signal chain. I don't have a lot of plugins on my master out. I keep things pretty simple. Make sure my levels are good. Make sure the balance is good. And... Um, I don't really go nuts with that. So I shut that off anyways when I export the stems uh, because, again, the purpose of stems is to let an editor recreate your mix um, to their needs. Uh, they might just want to use the bass for the first half and then bring the drums in halfway through and then bring everything else in and layer it in. All right, so next we're going to export all the synths. We can bounce all that stuff to one track. Um, then we're going to go ahead and put the strings on their own track, um, bounce that out. Remember they come in halfway through. That's why I kind of eyeball things at the beginning, just to be aware of what's going on. Uh, here's my two bass tracks. I'm going to go ahead and export those as one track, even though there's two tracks, I'll bounce them together, just label it bass. And then finally my guitar tracks. Now worth mentioning on the guitar track here is my final notes, I put onto a separate track um, because I usually add a little bit more reverb to the final um, chord or the final note of the phrase to just give it a little more um, of a tail. A lot of the publishers that I work for really like to have that big um, sustained stinger ending. And uh, I will typically add a little bit more reverb to that. And one of the ways to do it is to put it on a separate track. Uh, however, when I'm bouncing it, I put it together. Okay, um, now when we're done, we are not really done. Um, what we want to do is go grab our tracks from either Finder, if you're on a Mac, or the folder that it's in in Windows, a PC, and drag it back into your session and just have a look. Now, there's something my eyes went right to. I was like, oh my God, did half the track not capture? But no, that's my string track that I keep coming back to just because I wanted to make a mental note that it comes in halfway through. Um, as you can see, the rest of my tracks look pretty good. They are full tracks. The stems line up at the same spot. The tails look good. All the levels look good. Um, that's another issue with, with taxi submissions sometimes. Again, another video, but um, if you get something with a really thin track, there's a good chance something happened with the volume or your compression or your output mastering settings. So if your tracks don't look nice and fat, um, and mastered as you had intended, something is probably wrong. So this is why I like to bring things back into the session and have a second look. Again, nothing brilliant here, but you just want to double check everything before you send it to the client. The last thing you want to do is send something to the client that isn't good or even worse, just not what you intended. I mean, you spent all that time creating the track, you know, working on the mastering, the compression levels, make sure everything's right before you send it to them. This is kind of the 11th hour. Um, take a few extra minutes and make sure it's perfect. Now, from there, we want to go back into Explorer. Uh, again, if you're on a PC or if you're on a Mac, go into Finder and move all my stems into the stems folder. And again, I always label that the same name as the song in case the folders get separated. You know what goes with what. Um... Now, from here, once I have all my stems in their own folder, I think what I want to do is go ahead and compress this file because there's a lot of waves or AIFs, 
in there and compress it to a zip file to make it easy to transfer to the client, whether you're using Dropbox or we transfer a Google Drive, whatever. You definitely want to compress that file, especially if you're sending them more than one track. You know, if you're sending five or 10 tracks and you've got five, six, seven alternate mixes and 20 stems or whatever you have, um, make it easy on the client. So there you have it. I mean, that's how I would tackle one cue. That's how I would do my alternate mixes. That's how I would make my stems. That's how I would check my work. So I hope this helped you guys out. Okay, so everything in that demonstration was not necessarily the key to the city, but it gives you a firm understanding of what needs to be done and what these clients expect. So again, you've done all the hard work, you've created some great music, getting across the finish line and getting your great music into the hands of people who can do something with it is paramount. It doesn't do you any good if you have a great piece of music, but then you deliver the file um haphazardly and we get these files at taxi which is why i thought we'd address it now again we get some files with a very very thin waveform okay probably not the end of the world but there's a good chance that that was mixed too softly and something may have gone wrong with your mastering so take a look at the file when it's finished and see if it looks right like i was talking about in the video my files were about a minute and 40 seconds long so if something got bounced and it ended up being four minutes. Well, I know there's an extra two minutes of space there that needs to be deleted. Same thing if I bounce something out at 15 seconds. It should be about a minute and 40 seconds. So you want to reconcile your finished product with what you are delivering. Last but not least, go ahead and listen to it once with your own ears before you transfer the file. Once you transfer it to them, the damage is done. If you send something that isn't 100% perfect or 100% what they asked for, you kind of move to the bottom of the line on their call list for next time, especially if they get called to do something really nice like a, uh, like a closing theme credit or a prominent placement in a TV show or a movie. They're going to call the people that can deliver the files exactly the way they want them, when they want them, how they want them. Those people are going to get the call first, and I hope it's one of you. And there we are, back live. Great job, Craig. All right. Okay, so I, I want to address a couple things, and then we'll jump right in and start doing um, some Q&A. Hope you guys learned something from that and enjoyed it. Um, lengths. Craig talked about lengths, length, and I'm sure that we'll answer questions, but I, I've got to bring this up. The other day, I saw a video of a recently uh, non-renewing taxi member doing a YouTube video and he talks about how taxi just wasn't for me. Um, and I went in and looked at his history in our database. I wanted to see what he was submitting, how often he was getting forwarded. You know, did we do anything wrong? What the deal was? Um, I, I can't mention any names. And I'm not putting the guy down, but I'm just saying all this is about telling you to just do what the companies ask you. So <clears throat> in this case, there was a listing the gentleman submitted to, and I believe it said instrumentals between two and three minutes long, and he submitted one that was five more to, five minutes and 45 seconds right. long. Um, gee. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Uh, all right, let's take some questions. I wrote down, while well, you guys are typing some, I wrote a couple of down. Uh, that we saw popping up while we were watching the video. 24-bit um, 24, uh, 48K, uh, is that the standard? Um, I would say... I think it is. It, there are exceptions, but that is mostly the Most standard. of what I've seen. And again, that's why I say read it, because I have gotten requests for um, like 48K 16-bit, and I'm not sure why... But I have gotten requests for that as well. That's very That's it's, weird. It's very weird. Yeah. Um, really weird. Um, yeah. And uh, or maybe it was the other way around. Maybe it was twenty four. I don't know. Just I just do whatever they say. Um, but twenty four forty eight is the standard, um, and that's like most of what I record at, what I export at. You know, there's people making a case for recording at higher bit rates. Um, it creates these huge files. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. uh, recording at 96K and then bouncing down to 2448. Okay. I mean, I, I see 20, I record at 2448, export at 2448. It seems to be pretty universal. 
and I have a lot of music in circulation. So, if you can hear, most people can't hear the difference between twenty-four and forty-eight bit. I mean, twenty-four and ninety-six bit. Right. And uh, if you can, you're probably a bat. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to spend all day talking about that, but uh, I, I used to love when I was still actively working in studios where in Golden Ears engineers, oh, I can hear a dB difference. And we'd bring in, uh, one time we had SSL bring in some gear that we were testing out and we did a blindfolded test. Nobody could hear the difference. Uh, it, it, not until you get to around three dBs can you hear the right. difference. Right, and probably only if you AB it side by side. And too, we were, right? yeah. we were on yeah. like big monitors, actually in a room like very much like the one we're sitting in right now. Um, okay, you mentioned in the video mastering stems that you, um, and people seem to be confused about that. First of all, let me talk about mastering and then I'm gonna hand this over to Craig completely. People think that mastering is some sort of magical fairy dust. All it really means is having the levels be, uh, on in the context of an album, levels from song one are at the same level as song two, song three. So you're not going up and down, up and down. Um, it basically means overall compression and overall EQ. It's just one last pass, just to make sure that it sounds punchy and rich and has some depth to it. Um, yeah, libraries would prefer some mastering, but mastering can also be just throwing a uh, compressor across, um, why can I not think of the, uh, across your mix bus, mm -hmm. you know, a, a mix bus compressor with just a little bit. So the, the meter is just compressing or showing yeah. you a little bit of compression that often makes it sound the way it should. Um, maybe you get to that point, you go, the bottom sounds a little skinny and you had two dBs at a hundred Hertz. Maybe the top end is a little dull Add a couple of dB somewhere up between like seven K and 10 K. Um, that's it's not a four-hour process and a really serious thing. It doesn't have to be anyway. Um, okay, so Craig, do you want to address the specifics? Yes, I do. Um, because I'm seeing a lot of stuff in the thing here, how to do stuff better in Cubase or do stuff better in Logic or whatever. And and there there are. This wasn't a video about producing production music or about engineering. Um, I was doing it the way I did it to illustrate a point. And one of the things. Uh, I work for one library um, that does not like the stems mastered. And the reason they gave me was that a lot of times the editors that they were working with on that particular show that I was working for wants to sometimes have the ability to mix and master it themselves. So they didn't want any kind of mastering plugin on the stems. Now, it was on there for all the mixes and all the alternate mixes because that's obviously saves them the most time if they can make the, the full mix useful or, the, or an alternate mix without the lead or just the bass and drums. Those are all mastered. But the stems, they specifically asked to not be mastered. So if they wanted to recreate a mix, like a short version or, or whatever, they would apply their own mix and mastering to it. Now, with another library that is a lot... Um, actually more picky and stringent about those kind of things does like the stems mastered. So again, I, for that, for that particular demonstration, I was just pulling the mastering plugin off as a demonstration. If the library wants you to do it, do it. They're the ones who are going to watch your levels, dude. Oh, sorry. I'm getting all excited. And I'm right in front of the microphone. See, I keep moving the mic back and bringing. Yeah. Down sorry. Sorry. Just... No, I know. I know. We're getting going here. Yeah. I need to master this now. Yeah. We need some compression on this. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, a separate video, um, Definitely, um, you should do a video on engineering sometime or get a real, you know, get a real notable engineer in here <laughs> right. to talk about it. But anyway, my point with that was just how to export things the way the library wants. Because um, a lot of people are saying, oh, I know how to do that. Well, but <laughs> when it comes time to do it, when the library calls you and offers you the contract, that's the time to do it. It's not really to show everything you know here in the chat room. The idea is to get prepared so that when you guys get the call and get the gig, you're ready to go. So that was my point there. Um, there was a few other questions that burned by. Yeah, um, when a listing tells you to be ready to deliver alt mixes at the drop of a hat, mm -hmm. um, what should you have ready I'll alt tell you. mix wise? Yeah, nine times out of ten, and again, the the library will most likely specify this in an email to you where they will copy and paste it to all of their composers. Uh, mine say um, if you have a prominent lead, a lot of my tracks don't, but if you have a prominent lead or a melody line. 
they're going to want one mix without that. So it'll be, obviously your full mix is what got you accepted and got you forwarded or whatever. So that's your full mix. Then they'll want one without the lead, um, just a less busy track. They'll definitely want one with no percussion, um, just the synths or guitars or whatever else you have going on. They'll definitely want one with just bass and drums because sometimes they'll just, they can use that for a bumper. Lately, I've been seeing more and more libraries ask for a sting out, just mm. the ending, like the last bar um, with the big ending. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and that's great. And that's another reason why we harp on you guys to get those endings right for these cues because sometimes, I got to be honest, if they really like the ending, they might just use that. Not they, uncommon. You could get paid for playing a one chord with a with a storm drum or something i don't know but um so yeah so a sting out a no lead mix a no drums mix a bass and drums mix a drums only mix uh lately i've been doing a lot of music um for everybody wants music in the style of white lotus which mm. i i love the <laughs> the jungle drumming aspect of that it's right up my alley so i've been doing a lot of music um well if the producers of white lotus are listening you should definitely call me um but um I've been doing a lot of music of the like, and um, it's it's great because it's real percussion. There's not necessarily a lead line, but I do go pretty thick with the alternate mixes, you know, like no kibasa or no shaker on this track or no talking drum or no, no lead, but the drum track can stand on its own, which is kind of nice. So the alternate mixes are really, you want to try to make as many as you can that make sense. Um, obviously, like if you have a glockenspiel that has three notes throughout the 90 seconds you don't need to make an alternate mix with you know uh or put that on its own track or something you see what i'm saying like the alternate mix needs to sound like an actual mix um most libraries nowadays i'd say the minimum they want is three or four mixes um if you've got a lot going on probably five or six i want to address where it just went away um Robert Wisden, Whedon Wisden, uh, should we cut the reverb tails on the endings? No, whatever reverb tail you have in your master mix with all faders up, the stuff that you export should have exactly the same reverb. Don't change anything. Um, and also, don't change your levels. You will find that, let's say you uh, had a mix with a grand piano and it was predominant in the mix. Therefore, your levels are hitting yellow, almost peeking into the red, and now you're just exporting stems, and you've got uh, the acoustic guitar and electric guitar doing a little crying thing. Um, and you're going, oh, but my levels are so low because I don't have the piano in the blend, in the mix anymore. So I'm gonna boost up those guitars so that they're looking healthier on, on the two mix. Don't. Um, because they want it in the context because they may cut from guitars only to guitars with keyboards or keyboards only back to a full mix. So every stem should be output at exactly the same level it was. Don't mess with your master fader. Don't affect levels when bouncing. Don't boost levels so that you see more on, on the, what I call the two mix, which is old school technology, but your, your master bus. Um, yeah, sometimes I put, like, one part of that video, I put um, the end of a guitar phrase. I added a little bit more reverb to the last note so it would kind of carry right. through. Um, and sometimes the best way to do that is to just put that very last note on a separate track, and then I load down. I use a separate reverb setting on that separate track so that so it'll hang. Also, let's When I'm bouncing, I do put it on the same track, though. Yeah, let's talk about um, reverb tails and times. Uh, if somebody asks you, I, I know for some of you who come to every episode, which I appreciate, you've heard this before, but it can't be said often enough, which is if somebody asks for a 30 second cut down because they think they've got a, an advertiser that wants to use it for a TV commercial and your reverb tail, your downbeat is at 29.8 and your reverb tail hangs out to 30.1 or 31 seconds even, or 31 and a half, or 32 seconds. The computers at the networks cut those suckers off. The mixer doing the post mix on the commercial is gonna cut it off. So make sure that the very last of your reverb is gone before 30 seconds. I recommend personally, just because I used to be an audio post mixer that did a ton, I mean, literally hundreds, if not maybe a few thousand TV commercials over a period of five or six years, um, deliver it at 
you can't go wrong with a 29.5 because a half second goes by like that and they would much rather have it be ever so slightly skinny than ever so slightly fat. That, that is great advice. Really bad when you cut off reverb to go to the mm -hmm. next spot. Yep. Even people who don't know audio could give a damn about mm -hmm. all this stuff. We'll go, huh? Yep. <laughs> they will feel it. All right, next question. If you guys could be uh, uh, kind enough to type the word question in all caps just to make it easier when they start flying by. Um, Somebody has to hear some of my music. I, I got to be honest, like, my music doesn't sound any different, better, or worse than a lot of what I hear from taxi members. Um, I'm just really good at giving them exactly what they asked me for. That's the only difference. Um, oh, here's a great question from okay. Edmund Red. All right. Um, and honestly, I'm not sure I know the answer to this. I'm curious you, to see if you do. If you have loops used and the library is asking for individual tracks, is it okay to export those loops individually? I would say no, based on what I've been reading a lot lately. I've been digging in. Here's the reason. If, if the loop has been heavily modified, you're okay. If the loop is exactly the same as you got it from Splice or Apple's loop library, or wherever, um, your export, they could use it in the clear on its own. And now you've taken somebody else's creation and you're getting paid for it. If you take a beat, a drum beat that's on a loop, and you heavily modify it by adding extra drums and changing the sounds and stuff so it can't be noticed electronically as, oh, it's that one. But um, I'm pretty certain, I'm not a music attorney, but pretty certain my answer is correct about you don't want to export um, a, a loop in the clear that sounds exactly like it did from the loop library you got it from. I modify almost everything before, I leave. even yeah. when I have to use drum loops for hip hop and stuff, it's almost always the tempo is different or there's something different. So I, I have exported loops, um, but mine are all modified. You'd never recognize it anyways. And sometimes I'll use one beat from one and one from another and they're right. all intertwined. So you'd never know. Here's a question from Bruce. Capaferi, uh, so if I don't produce my music on a computer, I won't get placements. That's I produce most of my songs in my Yamaha SX700 recorder, then lay down stereo, mix my Zoom R24, and add vocals, etc. It's going to be hard to do alternate mixes like that. But. Yeah. Um, look, we have we work with one company. We actually, we now work with several companies that specialize in doing vintage music. Uh, and, and they have been known to take stuff that was done on a TAC uh, 3324, I think they were called, a four-track. That's right. A quarter yeah, inch. a Fostex or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, from back in the day. Yeah. And, and uh, because they're not looking for, like, record quality fidelity, they're looking for something that was recorded in 70, 1974 and sounds like 1974. So it doesn't have to be done in a computer, but uh, it all depends. That answer is too nuanced. There, that question is there. Are too many nuances to answer it. It's almost its own show. Sorry to say. Uh, yeah. Again, this is more about having you guys deliver what the what the what the client wants. It's for. not really about how you record or who's got the latest, right. you know, Studer plug-in or whatever. It's not really about that. Um, okay, question from John Clavin. How much time from the file start to the music music start? Um, I'm, I want to know what your answer is. I used to put a 30-second note out front. Now I'm up to a 16th because okay. I found on some playback it clips the beginning. Right. Um, but when music editors are doing it, as long as there's just a little bit out front, you, you, you know. You don't want five seconds. Yeah. You I, don't want 10 seconds. I, I I just got something the other day. It literally had about 12 seconds. I get it every day. Yeah. Yeah. It drives me and crazy. Your capacity is taxi's head screener. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I get it. I get a bunch every day. About a 16th note for me is what I've found seems to be pretty universal for what I'm doing. And now again, what I'm doing might not be applicable to all libraries. I work for four libraries pretty exclusively. Actually, one supervisor and three publishers, we'll call them libraries, um, and a 16th note out in front, I haven't gotten any complaints. That's what I'm doing lately. Okay. Um, scrolling down, Robert Else likes the Fostex comment. I'm showing my age there, right? I don't know. What were the early 
four tracks. I'm trying to think. Tiac, what, 30, Tiac 20, was it. 30, but there was, I think it was a 3324, yeah. 3304. I don't know. Um, all right, looking for the next question. Just wondering, are CDs, CDs dead now only being 44-1? Not if the music's good. No. Um, and, and I don't really understand that in the context of delivering music to clients. That's I think he's just asking about the bit rate and the... Yeah, I know, but we're trying... Right. Anyway, uh, we just want to stay focused on this one issue today. Uh, we're not... Yeah. Uh, if we have mastering plugins on when bouncing the stems, this is from um, Polly B. B yeah. uh, once combined, are they louder than the mastered mixes? Right, that's why the one library I work for doesn't want them on the stems because uh, they want to do their own mix. Mm -hmm. And if it's mastered, then it looks like a brick. When you give it to them, they don't have any room to maneuver. They might so not even see a good that, edit. That's what I'm saying. Like, so yeah. that, that's why I would think you would want the mastering plugin off for the stems. But if it's if it's a library that just wants to, you know, play like a like a to you know play with it like a toy and they want everything done i could see where they want the stems mastered so just do whatever the library says that's kind of the point of this um and be aware of it you know be be conscious if they ask you for the mastering plug-in on the stems do it you know just, that's a button to press i have one client i was reading that one thing but Yes, uh, thirty TX thirty three. There we go about the whole four tracks. That's great. That's a whole step. You should just do one on engineering. That would be great. I have. Yeah. You need to watch the show more often. I do. I do. I just. But I'm busy. I'm busy working for you in there. I'm actually. Um, question: Music for Spotify requires a minus fourteen dB luffs. I assume if they want mastering, this would be the same. Uh, but individual stems are kept. At levels within the mix, I don't understand. I don't that. understand that question. Yeah, really. but individual le individual stems are kept at the levels. Yes, individual stems are kept at the levels they were at in the mix. You never want to um, maximize the level output right. of each stem right. so that it's you know. At That's a what I was saying. Level. If it's a yeah. brick, yeah, you're not giving them any room to maneuver. Um, you want everything in the same relationship that it was with the other tracks when they were all combined and coming out of the master mix bus. Um, so, like I said, if a little tinkly guitar part was really low on the meters, leave it low on the meters. Don't get meter envy and bring it up. Um, and honestly, Craig and I, as smart as we both are, and let me tell you, mm. we're really, oh, really yeah. smart. Now, yeah, yeah. We don't know that much about Luffs. And frankly, I have tried to self-educate myself, that's redundant, on Luffs. Um, and everybody and his brother has an opinion. You get these guys that are like educators and really technical people. And, and yeah, <sighs> they deliver, you know, an hour-long thing on Luffs. They've probably never actually made a record. And what was that? There's a website that just changed its name. It used to be called Gear Sluts. I don't know what it's called now, but yeah, I used I to. I used to try to educate myself and go on that site, but the art. It would you scroll over like four pages of comments from all these experts, and I'm like, oh. And my you God. don't know how expert they really no, are. No, I know. Are heard. they just parroting something right. they heard elsewhere? Do they? Actually I'd look know? the people up on IMDb. There was nothing. There was right. no not a trace of the person. It's like, wait. This person's giving a sermon and they've never done anything. So, <laughs> sermon, yeah. yes. Uh, okay, question. This is from the Soft Lights. Uh, sometimes to replicate a full mix, certain stems have to be soft. Yes, I have found that these stems are often below the client's level specs. Um, the whole point of delivering stems is for them to do their own yeah, mix. Believe me, trust me on this. Yeah. I would literally gamble away my children on, on, that I'm right about this answer. That do not move those faders. Don't do it. It doesn't matter what their specs are. If they're looking for something uh, because they are, let them worry about it. You need to give it to them in relation to where all the other faders or all the other levels of your individual tracks. And by the way, a bass track can be a stem, but it is a track. People interuse, interuse, there, I just invented my own damn word. People use those terms interchangeably and they are often wrong. Um, stems are usually more akin to what I would call a subgroup, which is like all the drums, that's a stem. 
just a snare drum could be a stem, but it's actually a track. <laughs> so, yeah, specifically on the kind of the, the White Lotus percussive jungle music that I'm working on now, I will get a little bit more in detail exporting those percussion tracks. I'll put the kibasas and the shakers on one track, the big drums on another, like the bass drums and the taikos and the the low hits of the djembe, like the palm flat ones in the center, and then the, the higher drums and the, you know, whatever you want to call it on a separate track. Again, you're just giving an editor the option to make their own mix if they want. And again, if the deliver if that's what's required in the deliverables, just do that. It's a button to press. It doesn't you saw me in the computer there. It doesn't it just doesn't take that long to get it right. Um Gear Space, that's what it's called now. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, I tried so hard to fall in love with that place back in the day. And, and then I just bring it to a mastering engineer and I give it to him. I give important stuff to I have two great mastering engineers that I use for a lot of stuff. And I give them the important stuff. Um, can you normalize but only to avoid overload protection? That is an option in logic. I assume he means maximize, but normalize well there's a, a function called normalize right you know it's basically just a compress well it's, it's probably a limiter right that won't let stuff go, go past over a, a certain, certain point level. yeah um i don't know listen, and listen i'm not it. expert I, although i've got logic and have started learning more about it i'm not expert enough in logic to give you a good answer on that yeah um but if you it's almost a form of mastering. Right. It's avoiding peaks that will distort. It's just you're not controlling, you know, like the the attack or release of it. You're not a, uh, controlling where the threshold is. You're not a, uh, controlling um, the ratio. It's just a fixed ratio, fixed attack and release. Um, but it's probably done in such a way that it, you know, they they took the average. Well, it sounds pretty good on country, and it sounds pretty good on rock, and it sounds pretty good on classical. So let's go with that. It's probably decent on all those, but not great on all those. Therefore, that function trying to use that, um, like with mastering combined, mm -hmm. you're entering a black hole of problems, I believe. Again, there's there's professional guys that have done this. Daryl Thorpe, uh, Tony Masra. There's guys that have done, uh, I use a lot of the UA plugins and I look and see who built them. And then I go to their websites and look and see how to check out the 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 chain plug in on your mastering output and like I said I use ozone I keep it pretty simple but I have tried to build the mastering chain uh, one plug in at a time your 1176 or a Teletronics and then to a, some sort of limiter and then like maybe your Studer A800 plug in to give a, a little bit of tape sound so it doesn't sound so digital um, makes it sound more expensive so there's all sorts of tricks you can do but again I keep it kind of simple and I just again not to keep coming back to square one I just do whatever the client the client asks me. And sometimes I don't even always agree with it. Sometimes they ask right. me to do things that I don't like. Um, they may be old school th and they I, haven't learned new stuff. They ask they're me, still asking for I it. have given some ridiculous music. Another reason why I didn't want to, somebody I saw earlier wanted to ask to hear hear that track. I, I don't actually remember what it was. I'm not even sure if I listened to it while I was doing it because I picked it because it didn't have a lot of tracks and it, it seemed like something that could illustrate what we needed to show for this. Um, but I have had to do stuff for libraries where they make me make changes that I outright think sound bad that I wouldn't have done on my own. So that's another reason I'm not really anxious to play music for you guys because not all of it represents what I wanted. Um, it starts that way, but sometimes they ask me to do ridiculous things and what works for the show might not be what Craig's greatest hit thinks is great. Yeah. But, you know, hey, if you're going to use it in a show and it's going to make back end for me, I'll do whatever you want. It sounds better when the check clears. That's right. Yeah, Always yeah the, the, uh, that BMI deposit sounds really great. <laughs> Four times a year. Um, Bruce is back with another question about his Zoom. Uh, so if I submit one of my songs produced on my Zoom, should I tell you up front, I believe he's trying to say, that what I'm sending is all it is? No, nobody in the industry wants to get a note from somebody saying, by the way, I did this on my Zoom. Doesn't right matter. Here. Yeah, they don't care. All they care about is, does this music sound 
well-recorded, well-balanced mix-wise? Is it the right length that I'm asking for? And does it convey the mood of the scene or does it help the scene move forward in some way? That's what they care about. Um, and they're on the technical delivery of it, there, there are just standards. Cause we see it, we build playlists for the taxi compilations that we send out. Mm -hmm. And most things, like 80% of them, will be at a level where you'd be hard pressed to go, oh, that one's louder than the one before it, or the next one is louder than that. And then about every third or fourth or fifth one that we get, you'll see the waveform is skinny, the volume is low, and I'll tell you what, if you want to hurt yourself from somebody picking your music, send in something at a low volume or too high a volume. Um, and if they've heard a good healthy level and then a good healthy level and then a good healthy level and yours is the one where they have to reach over and turn it up, they won't turn it up. You know what they're going to do? They're going to pick up their phone. They're going to look at their phone, entertain themselves, and then hit... Um, skip to the next track. I don't know why that is. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe how cold hearted they are. They don't but have they time. Would, they would pass on my music because the level's not right. In a heartbeat. Yeah. There you go. They just don't have time. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It, it's these. Uh, you know, we should talk about that too, about the time, the expediency thing. Like I said at the beginning of that video, I, I'm definitely not advocating that you drop what you're doing and rush through anything. That is definitely not right. But the other thing, too, is remember that everything is somewhat time sensitive. Uh, what do you think is a good turnaround time from the minute a client emails you and says, Michael, your greatest hit was fantastic. I want it. And four others just like it. What? How long should, should you take to get back to the client? Um, somewhere between five minutes and 12 hours. Maximum 12 Maximum hours. 12 hours. Yeah. If you get that email at 8 in the morning, I would try to get it to their Within inbox by – Yeah, if you're in front of your dog, but definitely by close of business that same day. Yeah. Without a shadow of a doubt. Um, yeah. The turnaround time has got to be a little, a little better. Um, somebody was just asking, do I determine what the stems are or does the client – the client will usually, the client library will usually say, give me stems like mm -hmm. this. And just so you know, I happen to have a couple of examples here Great. from taxi client library owners. So here's one that wants a 10 to 15 second impact full ending of the musical idea, which is a sting. Da 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 da. Bump. Wow, we could go on the road yeah, with that. Um, uh, stems, bass and drums. Um, and, is that a stem yeah, or an alternate mix? Uh, that's a, a stem. See, I would uh, probably call that an alternate mix, bass and drums, because you could use that on its own. And I uh, would want the drums on their own track for a stem. Well, they may ask for that. Okay. Um, so anyway, this is what I got from right. this library. Um, can't argue with their nope. what, what they think is correct and they in their world it is correct. All right. Um, so bass and drums, just bass and drums. And I got to tell you, countless times over many many years i've heard from taxi members wow i submitted this full thing with a vocal it was my best work spectacular mix got it master it was amazing and they end, they say can you send me stems and they end up using the bass and drums because it doesn't get in the way of anything you shouldn't care if the check the check is going to be the same whether it's bass and drums or it's the full band. I have a funny story about that too. My my writing partner and I uh, did a kind of a sing, sing, sing type of thing a few years, many years ago, probably 10 years ago. And there was this big drum intro and then we, we had this beautiful orchestrated horn band and all, it was a great arrangement. And they, they used my first eight bars of drums and then they cut it off right when my partner's beautiful writing came in. They didn't even use any of it. We got paid the same, but <laughs> but they didn't they didn't use any of like the horns. They just kept that Gene Krupa type Tom Tom intro and that was it. That was all they, they use it on the Emmy Awards actually. All the it time. A, it was a so network placement. So you know. uh, okay, going back to this, um, some uh, this company asked for a bed, which is just the rhythm section, no lead. So bass, drums, guitar, keyboard, probably. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> no saxophone lead, no piano lead or guitar lead. Um, a bed with no drums. So just the piano and the guitar ostensibly and the bass, but no drums. Um, a reduced version, which is a simpler arrangement, uh, for example, fewer instruments or less percussion. 
Um, a 30 second version, only for music that could be used in an ad or a TV promo. So that goes back to what we were talking about before. A no percussion version, a cue without the percussion may have a completely different and usable feel. Um, a percussion only thing. Percussion only is a pretty hot item in the world of production music these days. Thank God. Uh, yeah, it started getting the drummer. Um, <laughs> and, and they used to be the butt of every joke, but I now know. they're like popular. That's right. We're long overdue for our respect, <laughs> man. There was a Land Rover commercial where a Land Rover SUV was going down this cobblestone road in a little quaint Italian village or uh -huh. something. Um He's sitting here playing with a thing right by the microphone. You know how sensitive that microphone is? Oh, I'm sure. It can hear your hair growing. <laughs> um, anyway, I just came up with that on the fly, just so you know. If anybody needs a writer for their show. Um, anyway, that was the first time I noticed a, a percussion-only track that worked so well that all of a sudden the rest of the industry started to follow it. They use so, it a lot in advertising, but I also loved that uh, Michael Keaton movie, The Birdman, which was oh, scored by Antonio Sanchez. I just I loved the score, and you I probably did a, went back three times blindfolded and watched that movie many times. And then and then all the libraries wanted that; they wanted drum set only music for for a couple years. Yeah. And, but you didn't really hear much of it getting used after that movie, which I thought was disappointing. Uh, the, the drum set only music, I think, still is an area that can be exploited a lot more than it is. The Land Rover commercial that I remember wasn't just a drum kit; it was was you know percussion mm -hmm. it, it might have been yeah. beads on a gourd like i said there's a lot of yeah. there's a lot of room to maneuver there you know um this is library i just read uh from before it says no excess silence before the song or the cue um that's a biggie you know nothing worse than when you hit play and you're nothing going, happens yeah uh, uh, no nope, you want play boom Literally just a beat, a short beat, and then starts. No abrupt uh, pops or clicks or glitches. Um, people sometimes, I don't know if they leave in part of a click note. I, I don't know, but I've heard that where you hit play and mm -hmm. then you hear a pop yep. and then the music starts. Avoid that. And then clean natural fade outs, which means don't take a reverb tail that's a second and a half long and dump it like this because that no longer sounds natural or a piano ring out or an acoustic guitar arpeggio ring out and then you give the fader a dump because oh my gosh i'm going to go over 30 seconds no just make the cue shorter um no, nothing sounds worse than dumping a fader um okay let's see what else uh so these other guys another library uh full mix and one alt mix um, and his naming convention. This is important. His name, so he's using a song title, which I think is a bad choice for an example. Mm -hmm. Everything and nothing. That's going to make some people confused about what elements should be in their mixes. Um, so let's call it Mary Had a Little Lamb, Mary Had a Little Lamb underscore full mix your name. Okay, Mary Had a Little Lamb underscore Michael Lasco. The next one is an alt mix. So Mary Had a Little Lamb underscore alt mix no lead followed by michael lasco would be good um and it's funny he didn't put his name in but if they pull it out on its own it's wandering around. i mean you could look at, at the metadata uh, mary had a little lamb guitar stem so let's say you've got two acoustics pan nine and twelve uh i mean pan nine and three sorry um and you've got a lead guitar going up in the mid going up the middle Give him all three guitars. A keyboard stem. Again, you might have a synth pad and a grand piano. Uh, give both in the relationship that they were in the mix to each other and the relationship that they were in context of the entire mix. Uh, a bass stem. Um, that's just bass. But you might have three basses. You might have a synth bass, a clean bass, and a distorted bass. Keep them all mixed at the same exact proportions that they were in the context of the full mix. Send the bass stem. Um, a drum stem, which is probably just the drum kit. A shaker stem, that's the shaker on its own. An effect stem, um, maybe you have a echoplex type loopy, 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 loopy kind of thing. Make sure that they've got that because if that was part of the mix and they heard it and they liked it, and you take that out, if you're remixing the mix by adding stems back together, it would sound unnatural without it. Um, 
Okay. By the way, this library also mentions naming convention um, for his stuff. So Mary had a little lamb underscore 60 seconds. So 60 SEC. Um, Mary had a little lamb underscore 30 sec. Uh, Mary had a little lamb underscore 15 sec. 60s, 30s, and 15s are the typical cut down lengths. Sometimes people ask for a five or, you know, like a one second bump, but those are rare. Um, okay, let's take more questions. There was two that were good. There's Pedro Marin has a good one, and if you scroll up, there was one other uh, good one. What are the typical items that the metadata should contain? Go ahead and take that one, Craig, while I search for the other one. The other one. one was a Pauly B question about doing edits. I thought it was pretty good right there. Okay. Do you make, so uh, go ahead and take On the, the metadata. metadata. The metadata is um, going to contain very important, pertinent information. And we briefly talked about this on a previous episode, but it's going to definitely involve your IP number. You're going to need that because that's how what identifies you to your PRO. Um the metadata is also going to be what kind of music it is. It's going to be like buzzwords and adjectives. This is a, an up-tempo hip-hop song with strings and bells or 90s flavor. And the reason the metadata is important is because a lot of times the search now, um, a lot of libraries use SoundMiner or these other software database programs where they mine for what they need and they will do a keyword search. So if they want hip-hop, they'll punch in hip-hop and then... 8,000 things will come up and they need to, they need 20 songs. So they're not going to sit and listen to 8,000 things. They're going to no, punch in not. 90s hip hop and that'll get it down to 5,000. They're going to put West Coast, 90s. West Coast, 90s yeah. hip hop. And then, so, so the more of those, Male vocal. exactly. The more, the more of the adjectives you can put in the file. Again, I like the AFFs because it embeds the metadata directly into the file. I don't know why all libraries don't use it. That's a Craig opinion, not a very popular one, by the way. Um, but a lot of them use WAV files uh, instead of AFFs, also a lossless file. But then you have to put that metadata into a spreadsheet. So it's a, another, another an extra step, which is why I don't like it. But uh, Anyway, the metadata is, again, whatever they want you to put in there. Um, sometimes, if you're really lucky, the library will do the metadata for you. You will supply it to them, and they'll put it in the spreadsheet. More and more, they're asking the composers or the producers to do that. So that's fine, but that's something else you have to get right. Uh, the more of it you get right and the better job you do with your metadata, again, the more useful and recognizable your um, file will become to them. If they punch in uh, the metadata from your file and it matches what they need, bang, you get the gig. If you were lazy... Well, at least you get heard for the gig. At least you get listened to, considered. Yeah. If you get lazy and you just put in, oh, it's hip-hop, they'll hear it, it'll be great. No, or, you're you're getting weeded out in the first eight thousand. Or you know? stuff it. It, it, you know, keyword stuffing. If you get caught doing it, which a lot of people do, you'll get away with it once. They'll yeah. see that you put in ten thousand words into one file, yeah. and they'll delete all your files. You put in, uh, yep. eight, you know, eighties hip hop, nineties hip hop, West Coast, East Coast, seventies hip hop, eighties hip hop, <laughs> Beastie Boys, Snoop, it, and you put all the keywords in. You'll you'll get to do that once, and then they'll see that you did it, and they'll delete all your music, and you'll won't even be considered. So it's important to get it right. Uh, yeah, it, you know, no, I have not yet met one, for lack of a better start, term, I've not met an a-hole um, that owns a library. But some people might consider some of the things, that, you know, like taking you out of the library because you stuffed keywords to the point of being extreme. They're not doing it to be jerks or to no, punish you. They're they very just, busy. They just don't have the time yeah. to deal with that. It's like, oh, God, another person or another you know, search that came up unfruitful or had extra stuff yeah. in the bag because this person thought they'd be cute. Don't mm -hmm. ever try and be cute. Um, well, here's a question from Polly B. Craig, do you make your cut downs from your mastered stereo bounces? By cut downs, I assume that he means like 50 second version, 30 that, second version. That's what the term means. I don't do from my mastered stereo bounce because um, I make sure that my 15 second Q sounds like a Q all by itself. So if I write a two minute Q and now somebody wants 15 seconds, well, my ending is going to be at the end of the two minutes. So now I have to bring that over and make it sound like a real ending. So no, I don't make it from the mastered stereo bounce. I make it its own Q. Those take considerably longer to do because, um, you know, 
you wrote two minutes. Now they want 15 seconds. You got to figure out which 15 seconds to use and how to. And what if it doesn't time out? What if right. it comes up 14, 5, or 15? Right. You're forced. That's how, that's how you end up with music with a 3 4 bar or 5 4 bar, something where the phrasing might not be perfect, but it, it matters less. If they want a 15 second version, make it work. And it's very difficult to do from your mastered mixes. Without, if unless you've got five edit points in there, I don't see how you'd make it work. So no, I go back to the master session and rework things as needed to make sure that the 15 second mix sounds good, the 30 second mix sounds good, the minute mix sounds good. They all sound like their own mix. I know people that go to the trouble of doing the calculation before they start yep. um, recording, mm -hmm. where they know <clears throat> that ultimately they're going to create a 15, 30, and 60 mm -hmm. from this. Put the edit points right there, yeah. Right, so yeah. they will literally, if they're not, being handed a BPM and a time signature and working within the context of making that person happy, mm -hmm. they will calculate these things in advance so that they don't have to back time it. And That's certainly one way to do it. Yeah. yeah. It works yeah. better in some genres than others. Right. Not good for like really legato. No. Droney stuff. No. That would or be a... something that's real string heavy. Yeah. Uh, all right, scrolling down, trying not to have it jump too far ahead. That was the metadata one. Yeah, we got that one, right? Okay, looking for the ones that have the word question in advance, and I'm not seeing any. Okay, we've taught them everything in the world. Nobody has <laughs> another question. I was going through a file of personal stuff the other day. Uh, I was here on Saturday doing some work and I was looking for something and I pulled out a picture of a major rock star who is deceased now, sadly, um, that I worked with back in the day. And there was a picture of him in the lobby of my studio in Fort Lauderdale. And I noticed that he might not have made it all the way to the men's room be without having a little accent oh. in the picture. Oh, so, God. I'm not going to do anything with that, but I've, I've had this picture for 30 years, and finally the other day I went, oh my God, he peed himself. <laughs> must have been in a day. Miami. Oh, uh, yeah, must have been a day of heavy drinking. Yeah. Um, Turnaround time. Yeah, 12 hours. Is that getting back to them? Yes, or reply with all deliverables. Well, I would think for 12 hours with all the deliverables. Yeah. Well, it, it depends on the circumstance. Yeah. If they say to you, is this piece still available? Just ASAP, but don't make it a day or two later or a week later. I mean, you know, they know that people have day jobs. So if they ask you at 9 o'clock in the morning, you get back to them at 5.45 p.m., that's fine. If you get back to them at... 7 p.m. that evening, that's kind of acceptable. Nobody's going to ding you for that. If you get back to them a week later and say, oh, I'm sorry, I was on vacation, they That's moved not on. good enough, yeah. Yeah, but whenever possible, respond immediately or close to it. Don't respond in like five seconds. That looks a little needy, maybe, and I'm not talking dating here, but um, it always, you know. It's, there's another episode date ta dating <laughs> with taxi i should do a dating show because i've been married to this wife for 31 years so i've knows. been married for 10 or no 12 my daughter plus two i've been married for 12 years now so we know so much about yeah, dating. yeah. but we this each, is where you want to get your dating advice right here <laughs> but we each were, were capable of landing a wife yeah um that's pretty miraculous ca caveman right style, yeah yeah but. exactly Okay, next que a repeat question. Uh, hold on. The IP uh, thing is important, too. Hold on. Well, let's try and take them in order just so okay. we don't miss anybody. Um, okay, I answered the turnaround thing. Um, two hours, J I see JP said two hours for a track. Yeah, you know. If you it, can. It, if the client reaches out to you and they've already signed something uh, and they want a different version, if you can do it in two hours, great. Um, definitely don't let it be, you know, more than like the end of that work day. Um, but the faster, the better. Don't try and do it in 30 seconds. Um, I don't know the answer to this one. <clears throat> what is XML chunk in the mix mean? I've never even heard that phrase. I, I think that's has to do with the MIDI thing. You know, what? I, I think that's one of the MIDI, um, functions where it, if you want to insert the, uh, automation and the velocities and stuff i'm not real sure i with something like that i would do it with and without and see what the difference is um but i think it's a i think it's a midi function i'm not i'm not 100 sure either 
I use the defaults when I export stuff. Um, repeat question from Don Coyne. Can you use arrangements from an arranger keyboard? And if so, to what degree? I have no idea. I don't even know what, I don't even know what he's talking about. What do you mean from a keyboard? Um, he's talking about like a, a, a DX7. That, well, where you press play and it plays a little sequence for I you? I guess. No, I would definitely not use that. I mean, I, I don't understand that. That can't be right. That can't be what he means. Ask okay. About, yeah, if you can further clarify that. Can you us. use arrangements from an arranger keyboard? You mean where you press play? And I, I can't imagine that being useful to a library. But I'm dun, not, dun, dun, exactly. Girl yeah. from Ipanema. <laughs> <Go>. <laughs> Uh, okay, here's an IPI number question. You know this stuff. IPI number, maybe it refers to the number one in this case? No. Okay. No, what? your IP number is the number uh, that I... IPI. IP is like your yeah. IP number for your local... I don't know what IPI is. I don't know what... I lost that one. Sorry, guys. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. I've lost that question. I just can't find it in the chat. Here's one from Anne House. Hate to sound so noob, uh, but if we have a song with vocals rather than an instrumental cue, do we still typically need to furnish cut downs when submitting to a library? That's a good question. No, but if you, you know, again, no, you, you don't have to. If the song is really great, it, it could find a home, but you could double your money if you have a version without the vocals you, and it's strong enough as and an she's instrumental. She's talking about cut downs as far as length. Does she need a 15, a 30, and a 60? Um, I would say a 30. If you can, handy. yeah. I mean, 30 is handy for advertising if it's a song that lends itself to advertising. If it's a song about, you know, something that just couldn't be used in an ad. Yeah, I mean, again, if you do all that work on a song, you know, the time to, while you're there, be, you know, make alternate mixes. It's just, it's an opportunity to make a bunch of money from the same song five different ways. If you have a vocal track, do one without the vocals and then start slicing up the instrumental with and without. You know, it's just it's just an alternate mix. It, it doesn't take that much time comparatively. You've already spent the money, the time, and the songwriting. If you can make money off of one song by editing it five different ways, do it. Yeah, the IPI number is the PRO thing we were talking about. Right. Yeah. Um... I think I missed one up here. I'm going to go back and look for it. Somebody type the word question. Uh, here's one from Timothy Rue. If an instrument library, production music library, provides a 44-1K in their samples, does the DAW conversion to 48 K make a noticeable difference or is the 48k just more relevant to mixing with video uh, I don't think it has anything to do with mixing with the video it's the quality of the yeah. audio but if you're upscaling it and you know what I'm not an expert on this but I'm pretty sure I'm right about this it's kind of like having a picture with pretty decent resolution and then you make a, a more high-res version of it, all you're doing is making a high-res capture of the original right. resolution. Right, it's not really going to... Up, up, right. right, it doesn't make it so... The right. same, I believe, is true for audio. If you've got something 41, 44 one, and you upscale it, and that's my terminology, I don't know if I'm correct on that, or right. not, to 48K, um, it's just taking that 44.1 and putting it in the new format, but it's not improving the quality of the audio by 20% or something. I would still do it because that's what they want to see. Right, exactly. So it's, to answer your question, yeah, do it. If you can just export it, even if it was recorded at 44.1, export it at 48K, give them what they want. Yeah, interested party information. That's what IPI is. That's a good movie title. Yeah. The interested party. <laughs> um, somebody made a joke to my peeing reference. Yeah, the bummer is I can't show anybody the they picture. I mean, and the guy passed away, I think, in the last year, so I don't want to, you know, oh. piss on him. That shoots my guess, then, if the person only recently passed. I was going to say Miami in the 80s. I was going to... I wasn't a Miami artist. He happened to be oh, working. Oh, okay. At... I was going to wager a few guesses as to what it was. But nah. if he just died, then I don't know. 
But he didn't just die. He died in the last year. Okay. Uh, nowadays, so, you know, when you get to be 60-something, so many of your friends and people you know die that just die, does that mean like David Crosby just passed away? Right, that was uh, in the last few days, but right. I just meant, Or yeah. do you mean in the last yeah. year? You know, the timeline <laughs> gets a little, uh, it's fungible. Um, <laughs> Uh, Ranger keyboards, basically smart keyboards loaded with styles, which are freely assignable, just like absolutes, but in the hardware. Yeah, so... Yeah, I wouldn't... I'd stay away from anything that's pre, pre-done like that. Just, they want original. They want create create your own stuff. I have three IP. Yeah, okay, that's... Andre doesn't agree. Well, like I said, Andre, I'm not an expert on that. Uh, with upscaling from a lower bit to a higher bit is not good. Why are there artifacts introduced or something? Is what's the negative? Uh, please post it and just put answer in all caps, Andre, so I can find it because a lot of stuff's kind of scrolling by. Uh, wow, John Carter has three IPIs with BMI. His legal name, two variations. Not sure how that happened. That can't work out to be. Yeah, that's a headache. That's a pain in the neck for the libraries, and we've dealt with that here as well uh, on some level. It's just It has to do with simplifying everything for the clients. Make sure your legal name is what's on. We talked about this in a previous episode, right? You can talk about it again. It's not all the same. Make sure your legal it. name is what's on the contract. Make sure the name on the contract is the name that you have with your PRO. Make sure that your IPI number is the same number that you write on the on the contract. Sometimes your BMI or your ASCAP membership number is more readily available. That is different from your IPI number. I know, and then and then they jumped on the chat and said, ah, in Europe it's different. Okay, it might be. But make sure that your IPI number is what goes on that contract. It's consistent with your name. And as you when you started out this episode here, make sure you have a good valid email address um, because they need they need questions answered. They need good contact information. Nowadays, email oh, is paramount. I'm glad. Oh, yeah, we did talk about that earlier. Right. You're right, about the taxi member. But we've dealt with it here. We have, we have some members that we've tried to forward, and we need their permission, and the email address is no good, or the phone number is no good. And it's like, oh, my God. you got, And the, the good news is that everybody's doing great music. So far, like, the music has not been an issue on my desk. We've been forwarding great stuff. We put together a great playlist. The clients are happy with the music. It's getting the other stuff together that's been problematic, which is why we got to hunker down and, and, and maybe revisit this video. The other one we did on, um, uh, what was that on? Another deliverables kind of thing, contracts and making sure you have it right. together. But, but we got to get better at that stuff because we're, we're hurting ourselves. You're hurting your chance for back end. Um, you know, we want to continue to provide these opportunities, but when you get called on to deliver the goods, you got to deliver it in the format that they want. All right. Here's a question from Marion Laird. If we have more than one name slash IPI number, should we delete the extra names and edit the registered songs in the PRO? That's hard to do. Well, see, that's the problem. Once it's there, it's kind of like the damage is done, and especially if it's registered in a song that's in rotation it's going to go to that IPI number. Right. So like the damn, you got to have it together the first time. So I don't have an answer for that. Editing something once it's already been registered is difficult. Um, especially if it's made it into a TV show where it's in circulation mm. and then they try to, they oh, fill out a Q sheet and they try to pay an IPI number that's no longer in existence. They're going to keep the money. Yep. So I don't have a good answer for that. It's, 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 it's why it's important to get it right the first time and be careful. Um, Ann House brings up a, a great point, which is always use an email address that you can easily access yes. on your phone throughout the day. I've got to tell you. Thank you, Ann. I, I've got several email addresses. One that is ancient, but has an interface that I much prefer over Gmail's. And I use that one. And all my friends and a lot of my business contacts know about it. They laugh at me for having it, but I have it. Um, I've got another one that family used to be for family and immediate friends only and that goes to my phone and then i've got yet another one that's attached to the business name so in the end i do have one that goes to my phone that does it i get 300 emails on my main email address i wake up every day of my life seven days a week not exaggerating um and, and spend at least two hours in bed with a cup of coffee deleting bs emails 
and then flagging the good stuff. Head I'm screener, at. delete. <laughs> flagging the good stuff that I absolutely <laughs> need to attend to. But if I'm on a vacation with my family, uh, I went to a, a lunch meeting the other day with an industry person at Canner's Deli in Fairfax. That's an hour each direction. I need to be answering, e I don't answer them by typing them in the car, but you know, I'll hear a ding and see one pop up, go, oh, better attend to that as soon as I get in the door at the office. So yes, always have one that goes to your phone, but probably not one that's going to give you dozens and dozens of emails a day. Make it an industry-specific one, so if the box lights up and you hear a ding, you know it's important and can attend to it post-haste. Did Andre ever post his response? Andre, I'm looking at you. There we go. Answer. Lose song quality, lose higher frequencies. Really, I did this when I didn't know and learned from the libraries about this. The libraries I work with say to never do that. Yeah, so do what they want. Do what the libraries want. Good to know. Thank yeah. you for educating me on that. Um, I thought it would be analogous to photography, but apparently I was wrong. I saw somebody talking about dithering and, uh, yeah. Um, as old as I am and as analog as I am, I do understand dithering, so it makes sense. Uh, Australia has one PO and only an issue one. Yeah, I wish all the I wish all the PROs yeah. did that. I know BMI has a, you have your number and then your you have your membership number, which is different from your IPI. I yeah. know at least some of the European ones only have one number, which is really helpful. All right, we've got 10 minutes left, so some more good questions would be awesome. Have to run. One of your best guys. Thanks, Carl. Thank you for watching. Say hello to Mrs. Wurzbach. <laughs> I don't know why. I love Carl's name. And when, you know, uh, Eddie on uh, Leave it to Beaver, hello, Mrs. Cleaver, whatever he used to say. <laughs> for some reason, when Carl Wurzbach was a regular hanger outer on the um, quarantine happy hours, I would go, Hey, Carl Wurzbach is here. Hello, Mrs. Wurzbach. I don't know yeah. why I do that, but I hope your wife gets a little chuckle out of it or hates me. I'm not sure. Uh, do I have any time for sleep? Um, you know what they say, I'll sleep when yeah. I'm dead. God forbid. Um, it's going to happen sooner or later. Yeah. Uh, all right. Any more questions? Because I'll end a little early. I've is got that at a bunch the bottom? Of uh, yeah, it's at the bottom. Oh, okay. I've got a whole bunch of family members from out of town gathering at my house right now. My wife said, try not to be late tonight. Um, Most libraries based in the U.S.? Uh, you know, there was a. this is from uh, Kinora Music, and the question is, her, uh, oh, a very relevant question. Are most libraries based in the U.S.? And, and Kinora is asking the question because of time differences. So let's say that you were working with a library. We actually have a production music library in Tel Aviv. They're 10 hours ahead of the U.S. I would say that most of the ones outside of the U.S. when dealing with U.S. composers, they know. They know that there's a time difference. They know they're going to shoot you an email. You're going to respond to it when you wake up in the morning. Their end of the day for using Tel Aviv, for instance, um, you know, their uh, 6 p.m. in Tel Aviv is 8 p.m. here in the U.S. So if they shoot you an email when they walk out the door at night, they know you're going to see it. When you wake up and start drinking your coffee and answering your emails in bed like I do. This is a good question right here. Um, Marion Lyard. Anyway, so the answer is they know um, and don't worry or don't stress over the fact that, oh my gosh, they're not thinking about American time. I would say 80% of libraries are US based, but we've been working with a lot of libraries who are not. Um, I want to take these in order. Uh, if you're registered with your PRO with variations of your name, um, it includes your middle name, et cetera, are they all registered at the same IPI? Is that a problem? Um, it, it's probably not. But in a perfect so. world, you just be consistent. Yeah, one everywhere. name, one IPI. Yeah, it, like, yeah, I, I rarely use my middle initial, and it screws me up. When you're traveling international and your um, passport's got a middle initial, and your driver's, driver's license, license does, does not, not, yeah, your ticket does problematic. Not, yep. yep. I get asked that question yep. all the time. Uh, and Marion's question is, yeah, when you're question. also releasing your songs independently, when you register as a publisher, how does that affect your IPI? Do you know the answer? I do. I do not. I do. Uh, first of all, the publisher IPI is different than your writer's IPI. So I'm first of all, I'm, I'm not sure why you would want to register as the 
composer and the publisher. I mean, the only motivation to do that would be if you have the connections and the contacts to get the music into TV and film all by yourself. You're saying you don't need a publisher. If you're registering as the publisher, are you able to publish it? Are you able to get it where it needs to be into TV? You have... Are you in bed with 10 music supervisors who are going to put that in a film and a commercial? Otherwise, you're going to sign the publisher share to whatever library you sign a deal with. Right. The, usually, the, the publisher is the one that will do that work for you, get that thing placed. So registering as your own publisher, I guess people think that somehow, oh, I'll, I'll take both sides. I'll keep all the money. But then it's also going to stay on your hard drive. It's never going to see the light of day. Again, unless... She may have registered on both sides when she created it right. and already had the publishing company set up. So it's sitting there waiting for the day when she assigns those the publisher share to a publisher. No, she... No. Oh, no? It was saying when you register as a publisher, how does that affect your IPI? So it's a different IPI number. Mm. The, publishing, the publishing companies have a different IP number. Uh, you'll have one as a writer, and then the, uh, the publishing company will have their own IPI. It's a completely separate entity. All right. Dave Doherty has a question. It's not really relevant to how you deliver, but it's part and parcel in a way. I'm going to answer it because I love answering this question. And it's a great one, which is how important is the song title itself? Should it have a unique name or could it be something descriptive like dramatic, pulsing, investigative cue? Don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. That's a, a little like, whoa, dude, you're going over the line here. But um, let's say if... Let's say your wife walked in the room while you're working on it uh, and you just are so in love with her and you made it Lois's tune. Bad choice, because nobody knows what the hell that is. Come up with a title that telegraphs to somebody looking at 800 titles in a particular genre, something that's going to make it jump out. So in this case, where was that? It's an investigative cue? Forensic evidence yeah. or, you know, uh, body bag or chalk outline or blazing oh. shadows. I don't know. Wow. You, you, well, you have to, like, think about, like, going to, a like, a thesaurus online for investigative cues. And, again, you want something. If I'm scrolling through and I'm like, ooh, somebody just died. I need to score that or... Somebody's going through the suspect's house. What are we looking for? You know, bloody knife. Yeah. I don't know. You know, that, that those are great ideas. But you get the idea. Um, because if you see a title called, uh, go back, not bloody knife, but you had a couple other ones. Uh, I, you'd have to rewind. Forensic files? Forens yeah. Forensic <laughs> evidence? Forens yeah. yeah. If you see a cue, forensic evidence, you know your brain is starting to hear that before you ever hit play. You know it's going to be wop bop 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 mm -hmm. You know? You know it. So, yeah, give them a title that, first of all, short is good. Short, uh, the shorter the better. Two, three, four words. Don't give them a title that's like seven words long. Give them two, three, or four words that is descriptive, but not so descriptive that it's like pulsing, arpeggiated, synth-driven right. cue. Plus, I love crime shows anyways. those My <laughs> wife and I fight about over the remote because she likes like romantic comedies. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, God. Like, nothing ha I watch one if somebody died, but they don't. They all, and then my shows are the crime things, and she comes in, she's like, oh my God, what are you watching? And it was like the Jeffrey Dahmer thing or something. She's uh, like, man, nothing, oh yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm not even going there. Uh, I got so much to say. I, I was on a long flight recently and tried to watch that whole Je Jeffrey Dahmer How thing. How could they air that on a flight? You wouldn't be able to watch that on an airplane? like With little kids sitting there? Right, that's you? what I mean. No, oh, yeah. I invited the kids across the aisle oh, come over and sit geez. on my lap and watch Jeffrey, Jeffrey Dahmer With, story. Yeah. I'm kidding. White Lotus is the same like that. Is the really? Same. There was some Too scenes. sexy? There were some scenes in that. Uh, my wife, again, she's like, oh, my God. And I'm like, yeah, right? Yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Take the hint. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. Song titles are important. Um, yeah. When you, Here's one from Mary. When you're also releasing your songs independently, when you register... We're, we did that one, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we had to scroll down. Okay, time for one more, and then I'm out of here like a shot. Yeah, my wife... Um, Craig and wife need two TVs. Well, we, I think we we have a bunch. Too. Yeah, we. we um, my wife loves HGTV, and I I don't despise a, some of the stuff. Some of I actually like, but I can't do three hours of this tile looks great yeah. on a black backsplash. I'm sorry, 
Um, by the way, if you haven't watched <laughs> um, we've that Yellowstone before. yet, and you haven't watched 1883 and 1923, they're all related shows. Amazing television. When did Tony Soprano start work for you? know, Matt just called me that today, too. Matt was like, <laughs> is this how you talk to members? Like, the Sopranos was a great thing. But I, I get, actually, I used to get Robert De Niro, like, more than Tony Soprano. Like, I'd, somebody would say something, I'd be like, are you talking to me? <laughs> <laughs> My wife and I were watching something with, like, Kevin Costner, one of the famous handsome actors. I think it was Kevin Costner in Yellowstone. And I said, man, I'd like to wake up and be him tomorrow. I meant <laughs> owning a ranch and having the horse. And he's just cool as can yeah. be in the show. I haven't seen it My yet. wife looks to. at me and she goes, I'd like you to wake up and be Kevin Costner tomorrow, too. <laughs> That's thanks, great. Deb. That's great. Appreciate yeah, that. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the honesty. Is there a show called Geek Out on Audio Gear? I would love Probably, to host that yeah. show. Uh, longer title with part of it in parentheses. I wouldn't do that. Honestly, long, longer, it, it just diminishes the probability of you getting that used. I know it, it's like, but it really resonates for me. It really describes... Short, short and sweet. Two, yeah. po- two, two piece names work really well. Is there a game? Wow, look at that little light thing showed back oh, up. Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, There's tons of stuff online about geeking out with audio gear. There's tons. It's just I stay away from it because, like you said, I never know who the experts are in there. Yeah. Unless I'm the one telling you, how can you trust them? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm all about mics, wires, compressors, equalizers. I like watching the how-to videos, especially for Cubase. But Cubase comes with its own community. Greg Ondo is really great. My friend Danny Lux is really great. And they, they show you how to do... Danny Lux, the composer? Yeah, he's a good friend of mine. He's actually one of the people who got me into production music way back when. Can we get him for the road rally? Um, let's talk. Yeah. yeah. He's um, great. But those guys show... The, and they both do a lot of production music. So they show you how to do what you need to do in Cubase. And it's consistent with what I'm trying to learn and what I need to know. So... The like Cubase has its own little community. I'm sure Logic and Pro Tools do too. Oh, I mean, I'm sure they the do. Avid community; those people, By the those way, guys are nuts. Apple just stole the head designer guy um, from Universal Audio. Oh, Nobody, yeah. everybody loves Universal Audio stuff. They never make anything that people diss. Anyway, Apple just stole that guy. Uh, so you can expect a year from now that Logic is going to have some incredible stuff. And I love the UAD plugins. That's most of what I use. Like yeah. across the board, I have all UA stuff, and I love it. So anyway, thank you. This is great. We should I, do this more often. We should. I was thinking we got that. the the Michael and Craig dating show. We have tons of podcasts we could do that we got from this. The dating show. Give me a plus one if you think we should do a dating. <laughs> Craig episode. and Michael's Craig and Michael's dating show. <laughs> we would probably go to jail. Yeah, over I would, some of that. Advice. I would not watch that podcast at all. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. And remember, if you're not a subscriber, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> if you're not a subscriber, there it goes. It goes lighting up. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not a subscriber, hit that subscribe button so you can watch more of these episodes um give us a thumbs up click the alert bell and don't forget to join us next week because robin frederick um the amazing robin frederick is going to be here with some great suggestions for songwriters and songwriting for 2023 we will see you next week have a great night everybody comes to fade. Leave a little interest in there.